Chapter 7. The Need for Public Education and the Formation of Citizens' Homeland Security Associations. Befitting a project that is not optional, the ultimate step for revitalizing the militia of the several states, within and under the aegis of each of the several states, must be legislation. The enactment of comprehensive sets of state statutes, possibly with a capstone of congressional legislation to provide any necessary uniformity in organizing, arming, disciplining, and governing the militia that several states may have overlooked or set at cross purposes. Before this step is reached, however, two others must be taken. A. A solid intellectual foundation for the project must be laid. It would be pointless to propose statutes that cannot be fully explained and justified, because legislators and voters are ignorant of the historical and legal precedents, principles, and practices of the militia of the several states, and therefore are incapable of understanding the necessity and proper method for revitalizing them. Predictably, too, those opposed to revitalization of the militia will attempt to discredit, if not ridicule and even demonize, every legislative proposal aimed at that end and every advocate of such proposals. Therefore, overwhelming historical, legal, and practical proof of all the contentions advanced in support of revitalizing the militia and decisive refutation of every argument thrown against the plan must be provided well before legislators are asked to introduce and fight for the enabling statutes. Self-evidently, this will be an ongoing, long-term project. A program of public education on this subject will require preparation and comprehensive scholarly studies that compile, review, analyze, and draw practical and legal political conclusions from the extensive statutory and other legal historical materials concerned with establishment and operation of the militia in each of the original 13 colonies and independent states from the early 1600s to the late 1700s. These studies should explain the following. 1. The nature, purpose, composition, structure, functions, and operations of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia, in particular, their preeminent role in the homeland security of that era. 2. The interrelated right and duty of individuals to keep, bear, train with, and deploy under arms, upon which the colonial and state militias were based, which they embodied, upon which they depended, and which they collectively exercised. 3. How these principles and practices became permanent parts of the fundamental law of the United States and of the several states, through the original militia clauses of, and the Second Amendment to, the Constitution of the United States. 4. The perpetual role of the militia of the several states in homeland security that the Constitution mandates. 5. The inextricable, mutually supportive relationship between the militia of the several states in the body of the Constitution and the right of the people to keep and bear arms guaranteed in the Second Amendment. And also, 6. The tasks revitalized militia of the several states can and should undertake today in a comprehensive program of homeland security centered in the states and localities. These studies should supply the resources necessary for preparation of the following. 1. Organizational and operational manuals, training courses, and other instructional materials on constitutional homeland security through the militia of the several states. Two. Materials that explain the parts that veterans' organizations, professional and trade associations, community groups, religious congregations, fraternal lodges, the patriotic media, and so on, should play in promoting homeland security through revitalization of the militia of the several states. And three, materials for public education on the militia in home schools, all public as well as private elementary and secondary schools, and colleges, including the history, purpose, and constitutional place of the militia, the contemporary role of the militia in homeland security, and familiarization with firearms and their safe and effective use. b. Even as the intellectual foundation is being poured to completion, 
broadly based citizens groups and organizations, indeed nothing less than a full-fledged grassroots militia movement, must be established to erect the final legislative structure. Americans cannot depend upon their state legislators and executive officers to undertake this task themselves on their own initiatives, even with access to all the necessary historical, legal, and other information. For, with much of that information already at hand in one form or another, for generations, public officials have neglected to revitalize or even to study the militia. And although now confronted by the pressing needs of homeland security, still continue to neglect, fail, or refuse to set about it. Without direction and massive public pressure and support from outside and wholly independent of office holders in state governments, politicians, the major political parties, and squabbling special interest groups, nothing will be done. Under these circumstances, patriotic Americans ourselves must take charge by constructing working models of revitalized militia tailored to each particular locality and state. This should be done through Citizens Homeland Security Associations, or CHSAs, that will study, design, experiment with, and establish the best methods for organizing and operating local militia companies or other units, and on the basis of this knowledge and experience will then propose, help to draft, and promote state legislation to revitalize the militia along these lines. CHSAs must begin their operations while the intellectual foundation for the revitalization of the militia is still being completed because their operations will contribute significantly to that foundation. Although history can describe how the militia were organized and operated in the past, only close study of and careful experimentation under present-day conditions can prescribe how the militia should be organized and operate in the context of today's needs and resources. Each Citizens Homeland Security Association should perform seven basic activities. 1. Organization, to perform and maintain itself. 2. Investigation, to study, devise, experiment with, and test concepts, methods, and techniques required for a state and local program of homeland security based on the militia. 3. Explanation, to prepare reports on such formation, operation, and testing for education of the general public and submission to the state's legislature in support of bills to revitalize the militia there. 4. Preparation. To draft model bills and supply expert advisors for state legislators and their staffs. 5. Promotion. To encourage and assist state legislators to enact and the governor to sign the bills necessary for revitalizing the militia in its state. And six, participation, to plan for and prepare to assist in, integrating its members and other citizens into militia companies or other units within the program of homeland security the state's legislature adopts, or in the absence of such a program. Seven, mobilization, to educate and exhort its members and other citizens in how to act independently both individually and collectively, as volunteers in aid of homeland security in their communities in the event, but only in the event, of some local, state, or national catastrophe beyond the capabilities of the regularly constituted authorities to respond to. Each CHSA should function as one, an educational institution for its own members and the communities in which they live, mobilizing and organizing them into a cohesive socio-political movement directed towards restoring the militia of the several states. Two, a political center for promotion of the revitalized militia among state legislators, community groups, and the general public. 3. A laboratory for devising and experimenting the structures and operations appropriate for the revitalized militia. 
at a minimum by investing, planning, and testing ways and means of organizing, equipping, training, and governing individuals in a local militia company or other unit, and then evaluating the workability of these structures and operations in the context of anticipated local and state homeland security needs. 4. A focal point for recruiting its own members and other citizens to volunteer for the revitalized militia after the necessary state legislation has been enacted. And 5. A facility for instructing individuals as to what homeland security functions will be required in their local communities should dire emergencies arise, and how to perform these functions independently should no other alternative prove available. A CHSA should never consider, designate, describe, or represent itself, let alone purport to act as any kind of private, quote, militia, militia force, military organization, or paramilitary establishment, for at least three reasons. First, at no point in its existence can a CHSA constitute a militia or any component thereof in the constitutional sense of that term. Second, a CHSA should only engage in the study of subjects related to, and the advocacy of, revitalization of the militia of the several states. A CHSA should never conduct actual field operations of a military nature, such as the following. 1. Requiring its members to acquire and wear military uniforms, equipment, or like apparel. 2. Directing its members to parade, drill, or maneuver with firearms and related accoutrements. 3. Otherwise providing its members or other citizens with actual military training. Or 4. Maintaining an armory or other store of firearms and ammunition. No member of a CHSA, let alone the organization itself, needs to assert the right of the people to keep and bear arms as a justification for his participation in the organization's activities. After all, an individual can study and promote revitalization of the militia of the several states in the abstract without himself possessing or otherwise possessing any personal familiarity with firearms. Or, a member's personal possession of firearms can be precisely that, entirely personal and unconnected with the CHSA's activities. After all, a CHSA might simply advocate that its members acquire, always possess in their homes, and regularly train with firearms on their own, yet never establish a member's compliance with that recommendation as a condition of membership, in which case some members might never come to possess or even handle firearms. In addition, because many of the problems of homeland security and their solutions may have no relation to the use of firearms, CHSAs should never refrain from recruiting members for whom personal possession of firearms is not a significant concern, is not desired, and may even be precluded by reason of their personal religious or other conscientious scruples. The militia being embodiments of we the people, must not exclude anyone who can contribute effectively to homeland security, even if only in a limited fashion. The well-regulated militia that are necessary to the security of a free state will always need and find places and employment for those individuals of conscience whom a free state encourages to stand on their principles. A CHSA must always present itself and act as nothing more than a group of local citizens exercising their freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas, and through it, their freedom of speech, of the press, and peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Everyone in the United States has an absolute right to advocate revitalization of the militia of the several states, because the militia are perpetual components of the Constitution's federal structure, with permanent characteristics which Congress and the states, or absent their actions, we the people ourselves, must organize, arm, discipline, train, and govern. When someone speaks about that matter to other individuals and to the public, that is freedom of speech and freedom of association. 
when he communicates in or through the media, that is freedom of the press. And when he addresses legislators and other public officials, individually or collectively, that is freedom of petition and freedom of assembly. Indeed, one could easily merge all of these activities into freedom of petition alone, because the ultimate purpose of each CHSA's program is to cause its state legislature to enact one or more bills revitalizing the militia of the several states. A CHSA's advocacy of its own members or of the general public's independent and personal acquisition of firearms and ammunition falls squarely within the freedoms of speech and association, and the press as well if the organization employs any form of public communication, and need not necessarily rely in any way on the right of the people to keep and bear arms, as members of any private organization. On the other hand, even if private individuals' possession of firearms is ostensibly illegal in that jurisdiction, the CHSA and its members nevertheless enjoy the freedom to advocate that the laws restricting such possession be changed, as well as to advocate the necessity for such possession through the militia notwithstanding those laws. Indeed, inasmuch as the latter advocacy would be constitutionally protected even if laws banning private possession of firearms under all conceivable circumstances, it must be absolutely privileged when its premise and purpose is to revitalize the militia, because the constitutional definition of militia includes the duty of all able-bodied adult Americans to keep and bear arms a duty the fulfillment of which no national, state, or local law can prohibit. Rather, being unconstitutional, such a prohibition is not a law at all, for it imposes no duties and is, in legal contemplation, as inoperative as though it had never been passed. That is not to say that the members of a CHSA and the organization itself can or should not assert the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and the duty, too, as a purpose and justification for their activities. Quite the opposite. In the final analysis, they are seeking to advance and effectuate precisely that right and duty through legislation that revitalizes the militia of the several states. Nevertheless, even if a state statute does revitalize the militia of the several states, and some or all of the members of many CHSAs in that state voluntarily join one or another regular constitutional militia company and therein exercise the right and duty to keep and bear arms in the full manner the Constitution foresees that all adult Americans should, they still do so only as individuals, not as members of any CHSA. Indeed, inasmuch as CHSAs will dissolve upon revitalization of the militia, Membership in them will no longer be possible. Moreover, every militia company in the state may be organized on principles, engage in practices, and be composed of personnel quite different from what any particular CHSA may have recommended to the state legislature. Also, once incorporated within a regular militia company, former members of a CHSA will become components of the governmental structures both of their state and of the United States, a status they never had nor could have had within their CHSA. If a disaster beyond the capabilities of regularly constituted authorities strikes the locality, state, or nation before revitalization of the militia can be accomplished, members of CHSAs may, as individuals, voluntarily join with other citizens to organize provisional community self-protection units on their own recognizance, under aegis of the primary law of nature, the right of self-defense, which cannot be, in fact, taken away by the law of society. Under such circumstances, we the people will probably have no other choice. First, grim experience has taught Americans that responses to major crises from national, state, and local authorities are all too often inadequate and even incompetent. Second, that these authorities have failed to see or refused to accept something as elementary to homeland security 
as the necessity to revitalize the militia of the several states, should teach everyone that they may repeat their sorry past performances in the future. As exercises of we the people's inherent authority to form our own militia, when Congress and the states refuse, fail, neglect, or are unable to do so in the face of catastrophic events, such ad hoc units would not necessarily be continuations, outgrowths, or derivations of, or in any other way related to, CHSAs. To the contrary, they would be formed even if CHSAs never existed, and under the exigencies of the circumstances might even be organized on and operated according to principles entirely different from any ever devised by any CHSA. That in practice, they might happen to crystallize around the seeds CHSAs or their members provided in particular locales would be entirely adventitious. End of chapter 7